Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about natural healing from a perspective that probably most people haven't heard of or approached of before. On the program today, we're going to be joined with someone who has spent more than 40 years of practicing medicine, psychiatry, psychotherapy, and homeopathy. He has also held faculty and staff positions at Boston University, Tufts University, and New York University Schools of Medicine. He lives in Portland, Oregon, where he maintains a practice that emphasizes natural solutions for mental and physical illness. We're going to be talking about his book today, The Healing Paradox. That's right, we're going to find out how we can take a revolutionary approach to treating and curing physical and mental illness. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program our guest, Dr. Stephen Goldsmith. Dr. Goldsmith, how are you today? Good morning, uh, Daniel. Thank you for having me on. You bet. Now, I really like what you put in your book. It was really quite interesting how you tend to approach things and you and you state, you know, a lot of times when we go and we try to treat illness, whether it's mental illness or a physical illness, that we try to push against what is actually happening. In other words, curing the symptoms, so to speak. And you share some very unique stories in here on why we go about doing it this way. Tell us how this all started for you. Yes, well, I, I was practicing conventional medicine, general medicine, and then psychiatry, uh, Daniel, for many years, and I grew increasingly disillusioned and frustrated with the limitations of conventional approaches in those areas. Uh, people were uh, doing somewhat better, but they weren't really getting well, and they were having all too often side effects. And I began to look at alternative approaches, first uh, psychotherapeutic approaches, and then eventually, uh, after some years, uh, homeopathic uh, approaches and other medical approaches, many of which in their practice and philosophy subvert the usual assumptions of, of standard Western treatment. And it's, it's very curious because the laws by which we function day to day in order to solve problems, to solve our daily workaday problems, do not work for healthcare. Uh, what I mean by that is that any of the usual problems we have during the course of a day or a week, uh, a disagreeable coworker, a flat tire, mice in the attic, uh, any any kinds of problems we have, we view as our adversaries. They're things we want to stop or get rid of or avoid or fight or flee from. Their problems are our adversaries, and that and that generally works. We pump up the flat tire, we put mouse traps, we avoid or confront the coworker, try to resolve things, but that does not work. In healthcare, uh, in the conventional Western medical approach, we treat illness, we treat disease, uh, understandably, as we do any other kind of problem. Our doctors and we, most of us, view our diseases as adversaries, as foes to be combated, uh, to be vanquished if possible, or at least weakened, avoided if possible, and that just seems common sense because, after all, health care is a problem like any other that we want to get rid of, uh, or rather disease is a problem that we want to get rid of uh, or prevent. However, what happens is that this seemingly commonsensical approach to disease entrenches it, ensures its persistence or recurrence paradoxically, and it's only only treatment I've found, and I believe strongly, only treatment that approaches disease as an ally and not an adversary can actually cure it. So it seems all backwards that whatever it turns out in healthcare, that whatever seems good for you is often bad for you in that it entrenches the disease, ensures its persistence or recurrence, and whatever or at least many things that seem bad for you 
or what it can take to actually cure the disease. And this it seems very bizarre. These assertions seem very bizarre to most people, understandably, because they they are contrary to our common sense notions of daily life. However, there are two basic reasons why this paradox holds and why our doctors can help reduce our symptoms, but for the most part can't cure us, can't cure us of most of our illnesses, which is why we have found in our society just an ever burgeoning incidence and prevalence of chronic disease of all kinds. The statistics for virtually all diseases that are relatively chronic have just been steadily increasing, both physical and psychiatric. And I contend that a major reason for that is our wrong approach to illness and disease. Conventional medicine can argue and does argue, well, gee, more of us are sick because we're living longer. But that is a false explanation because we're finding more and more chronic disease even in the youngest age groups, children, teenagers, young adults. So something is wrong with how we approach disease. Now, the, the paradox that I mentioned, the healing paradox that I wrote about in my book, The Healing Paradox, A Revolutionary Approach to Treating and Curing Physical and Mental Illness, is based on two facts. They're fundamental universal laws of nature that our physicians, my colleagues, my profession, overlooks. The first of these is this. When we go to see a doctor because we're sick, our doctor, after evaluating us and diagnosing our problem, tries to change us, tries to make us more healthy, tries to get rid of the disease or the symptoms. So again, an adversarial approach. However, it's a fundamental universal law of nature, Daniel, that all, all living organisms, including us, resist attempts to change them. All living organisms, in order to survive, must be able to resist attempts to change them, even though they may not be well, whether they're healthy or unwell. They resist attempts by the environment to change them, whether that be through environmental influences and disturbances like uh, drastic changes in weather, through uh, uh, microbes that are unfriendly to us, through environmental toxins, pollutants, or foreign chemicals, when we are exposed to them, our systems try to combat them in order to maintain an inner sameness, an inner dynamic equilibrium that allows us to survive and to flourish, uh, much as, for example, when it's very hot out, our body temperatures don't just shoot up uh, automatically because it's 95 degrees out, our bodies regulate our temperature to remain within a narrow range, vice versa, when it's very cold. And we react that way to all kinds of environmental influences and perturbations. And I say including foreign chemicals, and that includes pharmaceuticals, which don't belong in our bodies naturally any more than some of these other, uh, some of these other influences do. We try... We're built, we're hardwired to combat them, to try to weaken them, to adjust to them, to tolerate them, to uh, excrete them. We combat what our physicians try to do in order to maintain a certain sameness. And as I say, that's true even if we're less than fully healthy because even those of us who are uh, somewhat unwell chronically develop a kind of internal sameness that allows us to function uh, so that we are hardwired to defeat conventional Western medicine for that reason. It's a fundamental law of nature. We all learn in high school biology about homeostasis, and that, that is one basis 
by which the healing paradox works. The other is uh, seemingly more bizarre, but if your listeners can follow along with me, they'll, they'll see that what seems at first blush to be bizarre makes sense. Uh, and here's what I mean. In order for any of us to get well, in order for us, any of us to get well from anything, be it a sore throat or a paper cut or pneumonia, our inner self-healing resources need to be mobilized effectively in order for us to get well. And nothing can really take the place of our own inner healing resources. If our inner healing resources are too weak, there's no treatment that will help us become well. So that, for example, when we have a, oh, uh, I'll take an example of a, an ear infection, so common, middle ear infection, so common among children uh, and some adults. What happens when we get an ear infection? How do we know that we have an ear? Well, something hurts. Our, our, inner, our middle ear hurts. Our eardrums become red. They're, they become hot. Fluid can form behind the eardrum. Maybe there can be pus. We can get a fever. Now, all of those things seem bad. But if we look at the source, for example, of the fever, what is it that produces the fever? We do. Mm -hmm. We produce the fever in order to kill the bacteria, which can't survive nearly as well at higher bodily temperatures. So our fevers actually are a way we have of defending ourselves. Fevers also activate certain proteins within our cells called heat shock proteins that help make the cells more resistant to uh, outside traumas, including infections. Uh, so that the fever while it seems bad, and we tend to reach for Tylenol when we have 101 temperature, is actually a sign of some uh, hidden asset in our bodies that are trying to solve the problem. The same with the inflammation in the ear, the heat, the redness, the fluid, the pus. Those are all being produced by our immune systems in order to overcome the original problem, name, namely the sensing of some bacterial invasion. And while I'm, I'm not proposing that we do nothing when we have ear infections, we need to understand that the manifestations of such a problem are actually in part the problem, the original problem to be resolved, and in part the attempt by us, by our systems, to overcome the problem. So the only way that we can actually get well is for those inner healing resources to be strong enough either in themselves or through treatment that supports or enhances or stimulates these inner healing resources. Now, here's, here's where we get bizarre. Where do we find these self-healing resources? Well, as I just said, we find them in disease, uh, in the manifestations of disease. And this is true of physical disease. This is true of psychological illness. Within the manifestations of disease, we actually find the hidden strengths that are present in our system's attempts to resolve problems. Now, if we're sick and we're sick too long or in too severe a way, that means those resources are not working as well as we would like. But the answer to the problem when we're sick is not to nuke them. For example, in a middle ear infection, the fever and the inflammation themselves are not our enemy. They're trying to do something to get rid of the problem. They're not working well enough. But the answer isn't to nuke them necessarily with adversarial approaches that include antibiotics and anti-inflammatory drugs and anti-this and anti-that. 
but in some way to strengthen those attempts by our own systems to overcome the problem, those attempts being actually uh, observable in the manifestations of illness themselves. So those, those two basic reasons, the fact that we resist attempts to change us and the fact that uh, we need to have our inner healing resources strengthened in order to cure illness, not to have them obliterated by treatment, those explain the healing paradox. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to take a look at this from a holistic overall perspective to say that you're supporting and actually strengthening the body's natural way to deal with, let's call it an invasion for lack of a better word, versus bringing something from the outside treating the ailment, whatever it may be, physical or mental, as an outside intruder, you're actually more or less going along with it, in other words. Is that sort of what you're presenting here? Yeah. Uh, when, uh, when we, uh, either ourselves or our physicians, actually try to introduce something that doesn't belong in our system, such as pharmaceuticals, in order to attack uh, a health problem, we're, what we're doing, we're actually assuming the role of a kind of invader, just like the bacteria are, or just like uh, if we were exposed to toxins or pollutants in the air. We're actually, for all intents and purposes, uh, being sensed by the body as things that don't belong in them. And those bodies are going to fight against them, try to weaken them. So, uh, yeah, so we actually are going to be fought against in our attempts to cure the problem, much as our systems fight against uh, bacteria. Um, or, you know, uh, if we should have food poisoning, our bodies react against the toxins by excreting them through diarrhea or vomiting. And we kind of do the same thing with pharmaceuticals that don't belong in our bodies. Now, uh, first of all, I'd like to cite a, an interesting example that you bring up in the, in the beginning of your book, and that is the one about the Chinese cooks who might burn their hands with some cooking oil. Yep. And rather than running and taking their hands under cold water, which is an automatic reaction, you know, yep. you combat the hot with something cold, yep. if they actually put their hand close to the flame without singeing it, and, you know, and it turns out that you get a little bit of pain for a little bit, you know, a little bit more intense than it was before. But then within about 30 seconds, maybe a minute, the pain pretty much subsides. And if there is any redness, it pretty much goes away as though the burn never existed. And you actually did this and yes. discovered, hey, this actually worked. That must have been something to kind of put yourself around, wasn't it? Well, I was, uh, I, I, I didn't want to deliberately burn myself, but I had heard about this, <laughs> and I was kind of partly hoping for an opportunity to test it out, and sure enough, I spilled uh, boiling uh, water on my hand accidentally when I was at work one day, and so I raced to uh, the bathroom and put my hand under hot water, uh, and it, it did hurt significantly worse for, oh, I don't know, uh, half a minute maybe, and th and I knew it would, so that didn't put me off. So I knew there would be a temporary worsening, and then the pain actually went away. And I, after about a minute and a half, I pulled my hand out of the hot water, and it no longer hurt, and there was hardly any burn at all, just a teeny area of a couple of millimeters that went away by the end of the day. And this, uh, this is a great analogy, Daniel, to our dilemma that we face in healthcare. And by the way, parenthetically, I might mention that two of the editors on my book, The Healing Paradox, actually, after it was set for publication, uh, they actually burned themselves accidentally. And they, did, <laughs> they tried the same thing, and they told me, gee, it worked like a charm. And lest uh, people think this is uh, just surpassingly bizarre and I would never do this, there's actually, after the book came out, I discovered there's research at a medical center in Iran uh, 
uh, documenting that uh, laboratory animals, I forget if they were mice or rats, who were burned healed significantly better when the burns were exposed to heat. But, so there is, uh, in fact, a scientific uh, evidence uh, for that. But this is a terrific analogy because when we uh, burn ourselves, as you said, we automatically think of the opposite. The, the burn and the pain become our adversary, and it, it naturally uh, it's extremely acutely unpleasant. So what do we do? We look for the opposite. We stick our, whatever it is, hand or finger, under cold water, which is the opposite of hot. And as long as we have our finger under or hand under the cold water, it feels better. And we're pleased. It kind of reinforces our doing that because it feels better every time we do that. But as soon as we take our hand out of the, hot, uh, of the cold water or ice water, the burn comes back and it once again begins to hurt like hell. And so we put our finger back in and we keep it there for a longer period of time. Eventually, uh, if the burn isn't too severe, it goes away, but only after a prolonged period of time. But isn't that, in fact, exactly the analogy we could make to conventional Western medicine for so much treatment for so many illnesses? Mm. We have a problem. We take a pharmaceutical to suppress the manifestations of that problem, and much of the time, not always, the manifestations of the problem, the symptoms or signs, are improved while we're taking the pharmaceutical. But when we stop the pharmaceutical, the problems all too often tend to recur or bounce back until we then... Uh, employ some other pharmaceutical remedies. So it's a very close analogy in which when we attempt to treat and approach a problem as an adversary, an opponent, and particularly try to apply the opposite, it, it may suppress the symptoms, but it doesn't really get us well. And we look at the entire pharmacopoeia, the entire inventory of pharmaceuticals used by our physicians today, and most of them are classified as antis, anti-diarrhea or anti-inflammatory or anti-epileptic or anti-psychotic or anti-anxiety, anti-diabetic, etc. It's an adversarial approach that doesn't get us well. Whereas with the burn, um, I was thrilled, uh, by the way, I when I um, had this happen to me and the, I felt no more pain, I felt like I had somehow glimpsed some profound secret of uh, nature, and I was working in a mental health clinic at the time, and I just ran around to my <laughs> co-workers and told them, you got to hear what happened. I even mentioned to a couple of my patients, and they looked at me uh, uh, as if I had lost my mind. Uh, <laughs> well. um, so, it, uh, Because it so subverts common sense. But somehow by my putting my finger, uh, uh, or hand rather, it was my whole hand, under the hot water, it, it, it somehow, I like to think, uh, worked with my system instead of against it and kind of supported what it was trying to do. So that's a very good analogy, uh, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Two things I wanted to bring up that kind of go along with what we're talking about here is I remember uh, when I was reading... Uh, for lack of a better word, survival book, you know, when you're out in the woods and, you know, how you co cooperate with nature. And it brought up an example of both stinging nettles as well as poison ivy and said that if you happen to come across this and you get stung or you get the rash that usually comes from poison ivy, what you do is that you take the plant and you kind of crush it up so you get the oil from the inside of the plant out, and that's what you rub on the spot that you were stung or that was infected. And that's what gets rid of it. So here, the very plant that's actually causing the ailment is the same thing that you use to get rid of what you know is actually you know the rash that that you had. And I thought, well, that's awfully interesting, you know. Yes. And yes. another example too, I, when I was, uh, and I'd like to get into this in a little bit more detail when you talk about mental health, is I was remembering I was reading a book by Richard Bandler, who is considered to be the pioneer and founder of neurolinguistic programming. And he's he's a lot of fun to read, really funnier than you would think somebody of that subject would be. But 
he was talking about, you know, if I come across somebody who's a paranoid schizophrenic, I scare the hell out of them so they want to change. <laughs> and I thought, you know, these were examples that kept coming to mind as I was reading uh, through the healing paradox. But, you know, when it comes to mental health and you apply this, what does that approach look like? Yeah. Well, the, the uh, assumptions are the same. Mm-hmm. That and actually any good psychotherapist knows this, that in order to help someone get truly well, it's not enough to make their symptoms go away. The, the individuals who come for help need to have their own inner self-healing resources strengthened so that the therapist can help support those resources and strengthen them and facilitate them. But in the end, it's the individual's own resources that will help them get well. And it's the same principle. Where do we look for these resources? Well, we look for them in the actual manifestations of the problem. And I I could give you some examples. Uh, it's, It's very interesting just this past week Uh, I noticed that uh, there's one of the nation's most uh, experienced and esteemed uh, uh, practitioners and researchers on the problem of ADD or ADHD, Mm -hmm. Dr. Ed Hallowell in Massachusetts, I believe. He actually has developed a successful practice for this kind of problem in which he posits that ADHD is not the is not the adversary to be gotten rid of, but there are actually hidden strengths in it. For example, if you have ADHD, yes, it's difficult to concentrate, but that is also for many people that same that same phenomenon of ADHD also can allow one to be more creative, to think more outside of the box, to think more originally, so that there are certain hidden strengths even in that. But uh, there have been a whole uh, range of documented, the effective psychotherapeutic approaches to mental health problems that rely mainly on seemingly to support or encourage or strengthen the actual seemingly uh, pathological problematic behaviors that people come to get rid of. I'll give you some some examples. uh, Some of your listeners may may be familiar with the um, philosopher and, uh, and thinker Victor Frankl. Uh, he and also a Dr. Milton Erickson, an entirely different uh, form of professional, one of the great clinical psychiatrists and hypnotherapists in the world during his life. Both of them came up with what one might call paradoxical interventions in which they recommended to patients, let's say patients who were extremely anxious, I'm just using this as one example, extremely anxious in public. Uh, And, for example, Dr. Franco would advise the patients who would be terrified that when they got together with people, they would sweat too much or tremble too much or might faint to actually try to deliberately exaggerate those tendencies when they were with other people. And they found pretty much uh, just about invariably that those symptoms went away when they deliberately tried to strengthen them. Stutterers have found that uh, many times the most effective uh, tool that they have to reduce or eliminate the stuttering in public is, for example, uh, stutterers have gone to public malls and have approached strangers and talked with them and deliberately tried to stutter, and they found they couldn't. (laughs) So so somehow by trying to bring on the feared 
symptom, you subvert it because then it's no longer something that you're anxious will happen. You're actually deliberately doing it. So that would be one, one example. Another type of uh, example is in uh, family therapy or couples therapy in which uh, one of the members has some serious psychological problems. There was, for example, a group of therapists in Milan, Italy, at the Milan Family Therapy Institute, that developed this approach with uh, patients who had anorexia nervosa. This was uh, oh, maybe three decades ago, four decades ago. And at that time, anorexia nervosa was pretty much considered incurable. Nobody knew quite what to do to help people get over it. And they met with the anorexic patients, usually adolescents or young adults, and their families. And what they did, I'm making it uh, sound simpler than it was, but what they did was basically prescribe for the family uh, the same behaviors that were maintaining the anorexic symptoms. They would tell the families to do pretty much uh, deliberately what they were already doing unwittingly. And as they did that, the anorexic symptoms would of the patient would melt away. And they had a huge rate of success, I think over 90%. And I guess they just became uh, so bored with their uh, inevitable successes that they then turned to patients who were schizophrenic. And by the way, there's a book, Paradox and, Co and Counter Paradox, that describes their approach, which then spread to this country. And they met with similar success in treating the patients and the, the psychotic or, or, or quote, uh, patients and their families. And the schizophrenic symptoms would tend to go away in many, many cases without using any medication. Um, so these were quite paradoxical approaches in which they would commend the patients for the symptoms that they were having. For example, uh, one famous case involved a, a young boy who was hallucinating. I write about this in my book, The Healing Paradox. Uh, and he began hallucinating after his grandfather died, and the therapists commended him for taking on the burdens of the family after the sad death of his grandfather by developing these hallucinations. Um, and those hallucinations went away, and he did well. There's another approach, which is just uh, a, I would call it a tragedy, that it's not better known in this country. It's called the open dialogue approach, in, and it was developed in Finland. Now, Finland, up until, well, into the 1980s anyway, I believe, it had among the highest rates of diagnosis of schizophrenia in the developed Western world. These uh, psychotherapists and psychiatrists got together and decided we have to do a different way. Up to that point, they were uh, basically engaging in a pharmaceutically oriented approach, such as is the most familiar one here, a young adults, uh, which is the highest at risk uh, group for the development uh, of such symptoms, would come in. They would be medicated, usually with antipsychotic medicines. Uh, but they decide we have to do better than this because those people were not really getting well. More and more of them were showing up. So they came up with this open dialogue approach which is at its heart a paradoxical approach in which as soon as a recently diagnosed uh, young adult or sometimes older teenager with uh, uh, psychotic uh, symptoms would become known to the clinic where they work in Finland, uh, they would invite the patient in, also all of the significant other people in their lives, relatives, friends, girlfriends, boyfriends, uh, even in some instances, even a parole officer or a policeman, if that was uh, relevant to the case. And they would basically, the therapists themselves would not talk about 
the cases uh, except uh, only in the sessions. They would not formulate uh, what to do or how to do it other than in the presence of the patient and these other individuals. And they would go around the room, starting with the patient, and uh, essentially pick their brains. What do you think is going on? What do you, why do you think it happened now? What do you think would be most helpful? In which they would essentially make the patient and the others the experts. And they would, the therapists would bowl over things among themselves in front of the patient and the others. And they would, uh, if they had different views, they'd disagree about them openly. And they would essentially make, as I say, the patient and the family the experts in coming up with ideas. Now, what happens, uh, this, this completely subverts the traditionally authoritarian approach that we medical professionals and mental health professionals assume towards our patients. They come in, we tell them what their problem is, what we recommend, and they're uh, supposed to comply with that uh, and so forth. So it's quite the opposite. And in these cases in Finland, they uh, tried to avoid medication at all costs. Well, the statistics using this approach have shown an overwhelming improvement in the, the fate of these patients who in our society tend for the most part sadly to become chronically ill, to remain medicated, to be in and out of hospitals. The statistics are staggering. The, uh, for example, with this population of patients in Finland, when followed over five years, they had fewer hospitalizations than those treated with medication. 65% of them remained medication-free. After five years, 82% had no psychotic symptoms or minimal psychotic symptoms, compared with 50% treated with conventional medicines. More than three-quarters of the open dialogue treated patients were employable, whereas fewer than half of conventionally medicated patients are employable after five years. And the rate of relapses was drastically reduced. So, um, and it's very sad that in this country, the healthcare system has really uh, remained an obstacle to being able to put this system into practice, mm -hmm. but it works powerfully. Uh, and they're all kind of, uh, well, actually the paradigm for the use of paradox for mental health problems, it, we can find that in just run-of-the-mill psychotherapy. So that, for example, let's say this is such a common situation, I'll mention this, Let's say uh, we lose a loved one uh, who dies. And let's say uh, we start feeling uh, very deeply distressed about that. Now, our tendency, just as it is to put our burned finger under cold water, our tendency is to view our distress as an adversary, to try to minimize it, to avoid it, to distract ourselves, maybe to medicate it. Uh, with medications or alcohol or, or whatever. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, if we do that, the chances of our being able to get over the distress become less. The more that, for example, if we're feeling down and depressed over the death of a loved one, the more we view that as an adversary, the more we try to avoid that, to avoid our feelings, the more entrenched it becomes and the more likely we are to have psychosomatic symptoms. So let's say we're such a person and we're continuing to feel depressed after the death of a loved one and what we're doing, the usual adversarial methods to combat it aren't working. Let's say we go to see a good psychotherapist. What does a good psychotherapist do? Well, it's actually exactly the opposite of uh, an adversarial approach, if the therapist is good. What the therapist will do is, 
ask us about our problem, ask us about our feelings, put these feelings and our thoughts and our experiences on the table to look at, to think about. And so the good therapist encourages the individual not to avoid or fight the feelings and thoughts, but to face them and to look look at them as as uh, things worthy of uh, uh, as representing an opportunity to learn about oneself to get through this and so the good therapist views these symptoms as potential strengths and as the effect of therapy continues the problems will be more likely to get better than if they're fought against and so that's that's the paradigm of your everyday psychotherapy. And that's why, in my view, good psychotherapy works. It's not only because the therapist is nice and sympathetic that helps. Um, it generally will have far less to do with the school of psychotherapy than it will have to do with a good therapist in an empathic, supportive way getting the patient to look at their problems in a non-adversarial way, in an accepting way. And the only way really that people can fully get over their mental health problems, I contend, is to accept them and view them as potential positives and even embrace them as part of themselves. Our problems, our diseases, our illnesses, are not something other than them, than ourselves. They're not our adversary. They're not some other thing that attacks us. Oh, I got anorexia, or my anxiety attacks uh, uh, attack me again. They're part of us. They're not separate from us, and we need to embrace them and respect them as harboring within them uh, signs of potential strengths. So that, and that's true of all psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, when you take a look, too, as you were talking earlier in the program about how we tend to approach illness is from a very combative, uh, combative uh, stance. And one example I think is a really good one because it's sometimes a very hotly debated topic is that of cancer. You know, we have the war on cancer. There's a run for life, yeah. the walk for life. And you know, it's like people, they act like somehow biologically that we aren't allowed to get something like this, you know, that uh, and that we need to fight and defeat this every way that we can. And you look at the millions, perhaps even billions of dollars that have been raised over the many years for cancer research, and yet alleged they're still looking for this cure that somebody had actually found back in the early turn of the 1900s. What would you say with the healing paradox would be a way to approach something like cancer? Yeah. Well, um, cancer is certainly the adversary par excellence, isn't it? Uh, it's, our, it's our big demon in terms of uh, health care. I almost the, sometimes think it was something we created, that it never really existed until we gave it a name, and there it is. <laughs> yeah, but. and it's very scary to people. It's like the ultimate scary thing that can happen to our bodies. Well, the, the assumptions are the same, that uh, cancer is uh, our enemy, and we must... Uh, as it were, nuke it into oblivion if we can with all these unfortunately all too often toxic treatments that make the people, uh, while they're undergoing them, at least temporarily feel worse than they were before, although um, a certain number of them do make it through and do experience a remission. But it just reminds me again of that analogy of the finger under the cold water. And the statistics for cancer, despite all of these toxic uh, alternatives as far as treatment, are really not all that have not all that impressively changed since 
uh, all of these these series of developments with uh, designer pharmaceuticals and radiotherapy. The mortality rate for cancer uh, in men, for example, between 1950 and 2007 uh, didn't budge. Um, women, it did re go down some, but the prevalence of cancer uh, in women over the last quarter of century has actually increased in men as well. So am I saying forget about chemotherapy, forget about radiation, forget about mastectomies? No, but I think we can do much, much better. Uh, cancer is no different, I believe, at the heart of it, that at the very, very core, that there's some sort of inner resource in the person's system that has gone awry and that the ultimate form of ideal treatment for cancer would be to understand what that resource is and support it rather than nuke the cancer. Now, there's a, a, a form of treatment that uh, many of your listeners may not be aware of, and it's, it comes from India. There are a couple of brothers, the Banerjee, B-A-N-E-R-J-I, Banerjee brothers at a clinic in India, and I think it's in Calcutta, in which they have, over many, many years, developed a system of approaches to cancer using homeopathic medicine. Now, uh, to explain homeopathic medicine would take way more than our airtime, but essentially homeopathy is the quintessential paradoxical treatment in which the the central law of homeopathy states that any substance that in a large enough or frequent enough dose can cause certain health problems can, in a much tinier dose, cure people of those same problems. So it's essentially a hair of the dog treatment in which, for example, you mentioned poison ivy mm -hmm. uh, or poison oak. One of the best treatments for poison ivy or oak can be the homeopathic medicine derived exactly from poison oak. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, like I said, you crush up the leaf, you get the yeah. oils from the leaf, and you rub it on the spot that was infected. So Yeah, yeah. Mm. and it's an extremely, extremely tiny dose uh, that's in this homeopathic medicine so that if, uh, if a person actually who didn't have poison ivy uh, took it, they would not necessarily get, get sick but it replicates the, the pattern of the problem. So at any rate, that's, the, uh, that's the, the underlying assumption of homeopathy. It's an energy medicine. Um, so at any rate, these Banerjee brothers came up with a series of protocols for the treatment of cancer of uh, all different kinds. And people can go online and they can actually see for themselves with their own eyes the uh, case descriptions including before and after uh, MRIs and x-rays and the like of patients with, in many instances, far advanced cancer. And what they, what, uh, they will find is that the Banerjee brothers have come up with a system of homeopathic treatment protocols that can have extremely impressive results in terms of helping people who are even in advanced stages of cancer experience remissions. Now, lest uh, some listeners think, well, this is just, uh, uh, I'm just a snake oil salesman here, or they are, they should realize that the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Institute in Houston, Texas, and the Sloan Kettering Institute in New York, which are two of the preeminent cancer treatment and research institutions in the country, if not the world, are taking the Banerjee brothers' work very seriously. They have actually, at the Anderson Institute in Houston, they have actually supported research showing that the Banerjee brothers' protocol for brain
brain cancer can actually help uh, resolve it. So these are not uh, crazy, wacky uh, uh, practitioners mm -hmm. who belong in uh, uh, prison for fraud. These are people who are taken very seriously. Uh, there have been uh, visitors from my alma mater, Columbia Medical School, who have actually visited them and have been quite impressed with the integrity and the efficacy. And what, they, what this treatment consists of is the use of extremely, extremely tiny doses derived mostly from natural substances, uh, plants, uh, minerals uh, for the most part, and they're used to stimulate the, the uh, cancer patient's own inner self-healing resources. And they, uh, I mean, they, if uh, any of your listeners actually want to buy uh, their book, it's now on Amazon. It's, it's not cheap, but it actually goes into the statistics. Uh, they're very transparent in, in their work. And... I, I can tell you that if I or a loved one or a close friend develop cancer, their work is the first thing I, I would think of. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, the way we go about doing the treatment of cancer would be the last way I would go about doing it because, you know, we have actually approached this subject many times over the years we've been broadcasting the program. and. You know, you just get left scratching your head as to why do we continue going down a route that, and I can quote a couple of different medical doctors who have stated this, that our rate for carrying cancer with these systems we have in place, in other words, the ways traditionally that we go about doing it, has a 1% rate of success. Yeah. And I thought, you know, you wouldn't go to Vegas with odds like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yet we blindly more or less surrender, you know, our ability to make good decisions over to an authority that apparently knows something that we don't. And yeah. and there it is, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and people do that. People who have cancer naturally, they're very distressed about it. Of course. They're feeling desperate. And they reach out for... Uh, what authorities say, and because the public has been led to believe this is the best we can do, this is the best we can do for cancer, the uh, psychopharmaceuticals are the best uh, one can do for mental illness, and so forth. Uh, and as far as people know, these are the only games in town, but they're not. And the reason that uh, we think that is because of course, where do the mainstream media get their information about treatments? Well, it's from the professional mainstream organizations, uh, the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and so forth. So um, people don't really uh, have access to information about other, other approaches, or if they do, they're extremely biased and, uh, and inaccurate. You know, you bring up an interesting point. I was listening to the radio, this was some years ago, and uh, I had actually interviewed Suzanne Summers for her book, Knockout, which was talking about alternative approaches to healing and preventing cancer. And this was someone who had actually survived this herself and was yeah. just like you out there looking for, you know, the way they're telling me to go about this, I'm just going to die. You know, but forget about it. But... She went out and tried to find the renegades, the doctors that are out there saying, we're going to find other ways to do this that have greater success rates than the way we're doing things. Well, anyway, on this radio program I just happened to click across uh, was a doctor who's got a regular radio program and people call in and he talks about various subjects. So one lady gets on the phone and she says, you know, I was calling, I was wondering, what are your thoughts about Suzanne Summers' book, knockout and this is exactly what he said he says you know celebrities they go and they put these books out you know he basically just dismissed the whole book mm -hmm. and i thought you know it was so sad because she's probably going to buy this kind of advice like boy i'm ashamed i even brought it up in the first place all right and so she'll push it aside 
yet in that book might have been some resources, tremendous ones, yeah. that could have opened her eyes to just ask better questions and pursue better avenues than what she may have had available to her right there. And so that really falls in line with what you're talking about, of how a lot of times the media, you know, they just become irresponsible, I guess, for lack of a better word. Well, yeah, uh, and uh, another good example of this, uh, Daniel, is uh, homeopathy. One reads in the mainstream press, oh, there's no evidence of this, it's just placebos, and that's what people read. That's what people see for the most part. Well, if any of your listeners uh, would be interested, all they have to do, uh, this is not information that's hidden away in some dusty archives down in the third basement of some, of some uh, library in the middle of nowhere. They can just go to the website uh, sponsored by the National Homeopathic uh, Organization, uh, nationalcenterforhomeopathy.org, and they just go to the website, and there's a, a tab, uh, I think it's over to the right, it may, the, the category may be research, uh, and they just click down, and they see there's an archive of uh, significantly over 100 articles uh, documenting the efficacy, the validity of homeopathy, including research that's been vetted by experts on research, their placebo-controlled, double-blind, randomized studies, uh, some of which have been published in reputable journals, medical journals like Lancet and the British Medical Journal and Pediatrics and so forth. And it's just right there. People can see it. Um, uh, but for the most part, uh, people will read something in the New York Times or uh, wherever, um, indicating that uh, there's no evidence homeopathy works, and just take it at that because they have other things to do with their life besides uh, researching this uh, in depth. But that that's one of many many uh, uh, examples, a woeful example of the the deception that right. is promulgated by by much of the uh, mainstream, many of the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Well, we've certainly tried to bring people such as yourself on our program. It's mainly just to turn somebody's head just enough to say, but does this seem reasonable to you, what we're talking about here? Further investigate what we're talking about here, and here are some resources you can begin your search, and quit just taking, you know, hearsay from somebody who may be a, a good friend or somebody with a good reputation. You know, take it a little bit further than that. And I think that we're beginning to see that happen more often now, that we don't just simply surrender, you know, our outcome to an authority who may know something more than we do, but yeah. really investigating the matter further so that we can have the kind of outcome that we desire. Yes, yeah. And I think the uh, the Internet is a good tool in in that direction mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, people don't have to rely on one uh, just one source and if I may Daniel if people are interested in understanding more about the role of paradox in effective healing they're welcome to take a look at my book it's on Amazon it's in bookstores the healing paradox a revolutionary approach to treating and curing physical and mental illness um, and you have a website also. Yes. It's www.greenpsychiatrist.com. I like that. <laughs> the book is The Healing Paradox, A Revolutionary Approach to Treating and Curing Physical and Mental Illness. Dr. Stephen Goldsmith, it's been a pleasure to have you here on the program today. Thank you so much for having me, Daniel. I enjoyed it. Thank you. We want to thank you, the listeners. You can find out more. Visit us at beyond50radio.com. We'll have a hot link there for you for Dr. Stephen Goldsmith's website so you can find out more as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>